All right, so um, we had, I don't know, close to 100 questions that were submitted. Um, we're very happy that everyone's so enthusiastic about the questions. We're gonna do our best. I tried to group everything together as much as, as possible. So let's get right to it. Um, one question I think that's great to kick this off with is how many people in the audience are patients? Could you raise your hands? Patients. Okay, wow. <laughs> Very quick count. Caregivers. Family members. Those are common. Okay, wow. All right, I think that was an important one for all of us to see to, uh, um, as we go forward with this. All right, so I'm gonna start with some questions that I think can be sort of directed to everybody on the panel and um, you know, we can, you're welcome to jump in as you, as you have an answer. Um, so the, uh, a lot of what we saw this morning was about metabolism and metabolomic studies. Um, can, can, uh, can those speakers who's, who address those issues, can you talk about uh, whether the changes that you've observed in metabolomic studies have been related to changes in gene or protein expression or how you might plan to um, integrate that into your studies in future? Chris, sure. sorry I looked at you, but... Yeah, yeah no worries. Um, yeah, well, you plan to integrate that information with studying, I guess, the proteomics and the genomics with the metabolomics all at once in, in the same patient groups and from the same samples is probably the best situation to do that. Unfortunately, you know, we haven't done that yet, but we are doing that. So um, that research is, is something that will happen eventually. Um, I believe more of that sort of work is happening um, in other groups, so I think... Um, yeah, I, I think can't we'll hear a bit about that. that this afternoon as well, but... Uh, sure. Yeah. Neil? Uh, when we've looked at the metabolome, we clearly see... You clearly see what are genetic-based changes going on. As, as we've said, we, just, we haven't put the data together yet. Um, it will happen, but I, I would expect to see certain signatures of metabolic change go with, with genes or gene patterns. Um, we would also expect to see changes to go with the, the pathogen or the initiator, and that's where the complexity will be. Um, and it, you just need large data sets to actually analyze it all properly. Uh, one, I'd add one, one thing to this is if you consider mitochondria as semi-solid state bioreactors that contain about 500 catalytic proteins or enzymes, um, each one of those turns that could just stay at the, the exact same expression level with no change in gene expression, and yet you could see a thousand-fold change in the actual catalytic activity just by the availability of the, the molecules that they con convert to product. So, so this this is you know um, a classic what's called Michaelis Menten kinetics and allosteric regulation, but you know so there are a lot of things that actually happen in a practical way in a minute to minute second to second way um, that regulate how we respond to you know diet and exercise and you know um, encounters with toxins and the environment that don't have to involve gene expression changes at all. One of the ways we look at that is we do substrate um, product ratios and, and that, that tells us a lot about which things are moving and uh, what they relate to. So, I mean, you can do, like, you can do a glucose lactate ratio or you can do a glucose pyruvate ratio and, when, or, and you can see how those things relate to changes in glycolysis, etc. Um, a related question that came up from uh, a couple of different sources was, um, if you're looking at metabolomics um, in patients versus controls, how can you figure out whether you're looking at differences that might be due to low activity levels or being bedridden? Um, how would that look for healthy patients or healthy people who are bedridden uh, in comparison to what you see in CFS? Okay, well, I'll start. Um, so the way that you would possibly do that uh, would be trending towards doing longitudinal studies, which is what we're looking at, which is to look at the individual as their own control compared to themselves uh, during better and worse times, and controlling for their own genes and their own 
um, environmental makeup that that, can, that make up that individual, which you know it's very hard to get across that consistency across a whole bunch of other people because they all have a number of other factors. Uh, and but in the studies that we look at, um, that is quite different. I mean, it's quite sorry, it's quite difficult with the population studies and trying to get people as sedentary as people with MECFS, obviously. Maybe I can add something to that also. I think, uh, as you say, temporal resolved samples is very important. Uh, and also to understand what is the biological variability in the normal population, to have that as a background. Uh, and then we generate enormous amount of data, so we have to crunch all this data to, to be able to look at it. And in that process, we have to normalize the data. And I, I'm sure we, we lose some information in that process, but that's unfortunately what we need to do right now. So I'd like to comment, this is one reason we're very interested in incorporating an exercise challenge or some other stressor uh, into the study so that you can use the patient as their own control. As I mentioned, have them in their usual bad state and then make them worse. But it is also possible to find sedentary controls who, whose activity level is not much more than some of the people who have at least a, a few hours of upright activity. Uh, one time a reviewer uh, from, uh, I think this reviewer is from uh, uh, Europe where people exercise more and said, told me that uh, we wouldn't be able to find any such sedentary controls. And I said, in the U.S. we can find a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things we can detect during a period of exacerbation is things like sucrose in the urine and, and things like that. So, I mean, they, they can only get there. If, if there's a leaky bowel situation. So, but they're the sort of things that we would look uh, for. We, we'd try and get patients to score whether they've had a bad week or a, and do all that sort of thing. We can follow their symptom variations. We can follow, this. and so the longitudinal studies are, are good because that tells you about their natural exacerbation, whereas the, the controlled, you will do this type study, that's what it is, isn't it? One of those, and th those sorts of studies basically can, can you can do it in a much, far more refined state, but you're likely to see variation between individuals anyhow. And there are already papers published on um, the, the real, how, metabol how metabolism changes uh, with sedentary individuals compared to ac active individuals, um, and the sedentary is actually much much different than the the pattern that we see in, in patients with MECFS. That's, that's valuable to hear. And, um, and I think Maureen just addressed one of the other questions that came up, which is looking at the metabolic response um, associated with PEM and, uh, and exertion in patients. So, great, okay. Um, another very popular topic in the questions was the, uh, was the relationships to other diseases and conditions. Um, for example, Lyme disease, uh, chronic Lyme disease, lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, bacterial infections, irritable bowel syndrome. Autism was not in there, but thank you, yes. <laughs> um, insulin resistance um, and potentially diabetes is sort of a corollary to that. So I guess the, the, what it would be good to hear from the panel about is, um, you know, what, how do we, first of all, how do we be sure that what we're seeing in CFS patients is not due to these other disorders being present? That's one question. A second question is, um, what can we learn from those other diseases as we're trying to understand uh, MECFS? And a third question is, um, how does this direct us towards treatments? So please answer all of those questions. In <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, I'll start. Uh, it's a complicated question, but um, I'll, I'll start by saying that um, we, we consider autism and MECFS as part of the same biologic and physiologic spectrum. Um, and that the things that differ are the fact that in one case the triggers um, were encountered um, and may in fact be genetic, but encountered early in life during critical neurodevelopment. Um, and then MECFS um, are encountered later in life and lead to you know, this outcome of, of um, you know, the syndrome of MECFS. So the Many of the same genetic predispositions, the genes that come up um, as predisposing to autism end up predisposing to MECFS. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing that, that 
is a common observation in autism, but it has not been made enough um, yet in, in patients with ME-CFS, but I find it to be true, is that the people that are affected are actually um, among the, uh, our generation's be best and brightest. These are, these are individuals who are you know, born with unique gifts, the ability to actually sense the world in novel ways that we, we you know, uh, normal, <laughs> the, 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 you know, normal human beings are, are not able to, to, to sense subtle differences in the social network uh, in, in groups of people that uh, children with autism and as well as children and, and ME-CFS patients can sense. The ability to actually see color more vividly, to smell things more vividly, to taste more vividly. You know, these are actually created by cellular differences that create unique vulnerabilities. Okay, and those vulnerabilities then lead to um, this sequence of pathogenesis that we now call ME-CFS. Okay, so other than uh, uh, the, the, that particular, uh, most of the, the diseases that people mention there are autoimmune diseases. Uh, so that's one thing that's in common with, with what's going on there. Uh, not all of them, obviously. Uh, but uh, one of those things, as I mentioned already, is something that we didn't really expect, which is that we, when we started asking the patients, how many people in your family have autoimmune disease, we found that the families had a lot more autoimmune disease than we had ever uh, ex expected. So one possibility is that, in fact, there is an overall autoimmune disease uh, that can, can occur, but that it's tissue specific. So that, in fact, it might be, depending on which tissue gets attacked, you end up with the specific disease you have. So in the case of fatigue, it would be a chronic fatigue and uh, ME. It would be that you're attacking the fatigue system, uh, the tissues that are involved there. Whereas in other cases, it might be something else. That's one possibility. Uh, other possibilities are that, in fact, there is, a, there is an overall haplotype that, that is out there. It's a similar thing, but in fact, it's a little bit different if you, if you look at that. So we are currently looking at uh, patients who do have uh, 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 other potential diseases here, uh, and we're doing it partly because the, the uh, people want to know, uh, and some physicians have been asking, is, is this just a, just a different form of depression, for example? So we're actually comparing the patients with depression patients. We've actually got information from our gene expression saying, no, they're not the same already, but we want to confirm that with a much larger sample and with better, better methods, and so that's what we're doing right now. Same thing with migraine headache. A lot of patients have migraine headache. So the question is, is this something that's inherent that's going on here, or is it something different? So we're looking at uh, patients who have uh, severe uh, uh, migraine headache, or very, very common migraine headache, at least. So we're looking at a, a good cohort of those as well, and trying to see what's really different in these patients. Uh, and then we're looking at so-called healthy controls as well. In the past, we've looked at very debilitated controls as well to try to figure out what's different in them. They're quite a bit different than the patients. Uh, well, when we look at um, standardized depression scores, standardized anxiety scores, and things like that, we actually see that they're quite distinct chemistry. Um, when you compare the chemistry sets that we see within the CFS population with that you'd, you'd expect to see in, in a normal depression uh, analysis, you, you actually find they're very similar. So the, those with high depression scores will usually have an alteration in TSH, sorry, thyroid stimulating hormone, and you'll see anomalies in thyroid, in, in tryptophan absorption rates in, in, in the kidney, and you can see that it's inflammatory driven, and that's exactly what you see in, de, in, de, in the depression studies out there. So it does not appear to be entirely different, but when you look at them as a cluster, you see that the MECFS people are definitely distinct. Um, and it really depends on which definition you use. If you use the Holmes definition or the, the um, Fukuda definition, you, you see variations in that. So it's really important to get the definition correct. Um, and maybe if we can find gene markers for particular subgroups or sets, and then we can study them and call them for what they are, I think that may be the long-term outcome of benefit to all of you, that is.
Um, on a related note, um, there was a question regarding why it is that uh, MECFS often starts um, or is exacerbated by stressful periods um, during, during uh, patients' lives. Could this be things like the, the cell danger response? Could it be related to autoantibodies? Um, what, what do you think is going on? Uh, my feeling about that is that it's well known that during stress, your immune system is less functional. You're less able to fight, fight off infection. And so I often have thought that some of the people who report that they you know, became ill when they got divorced or they had some terrible stress at work, they were actually already fighting off something. And that was tilted them over the edge, that, that their immune system just couldn't cope with whatever they were being at attacked by. And, and that could be why uh, they, they think that was the actual trigger. But it could have been some, something that was already happening and that, and that the stress really uh, impaired the immune system to the point where they uh, could no longer cope with whatever was uh, you know, causing the problem. So that's a really good answer. Uh, uh, our, our answer is very similar to that, which is that it's amazing how much redundancy there are in these systems, particularly the fatigue system. It's one, and this is part of the problem that with chronic fatigue syndrome, is that almost everybody else doesn't have this problem. <laughs> and they don't have it because there is a lot of redundancy in the system. So what we think is going on is that in fact, and very similar to, to the, what you described, is that in fact uh, you, the, the chronic fatigue patients, they have other things going on in them already and, and that in fact they have something, they're much closer to going over the edge so that it just takes a, the smallest little nudge to pull them past the last bit of the edge and over they go and now they have chronic fatigue sy syndrome where in fact in the, in the past they might have gotten sick, had some fatigue and then got better again right away. So. Uh, uh, so we think that, in fact, there is an underlying susceptibility already out there. That's one of the things that's going on in the patients. And then something happens, as uh, uh, Maureen was saying, and then that pushes them over the edge. If you look at the, um, the post-viral fatigue study that they did in Dubbo, uh, in New South Wales in Australia, what they did was they took everybody that had glandular fever and they just kept following them. And, and what they found is the, the vast majority of them ha had their event and six months later they were, they were all, all over, all gone. There's just a very small percentage at the top end of the scale that, that ended up with persistence. Now, the, the, these were all subject to the same stimulus. They all lived in the same town. They all, whatever stimuli were going around probably affected multitudes of them. Um, and so, to me, there's clearly some underlying susceptibility that determines their negative outcome. Other comments on that? No. Okay. Um, uh, there were a couple of questions about, um, about diets, um, given the focus on metabolism, I think. Um, so, ketogenic diets are becoming more popular. Um, among some CFS patients, and as well as for uh, general health and uh, decreasing inflammation. Um, so th the question, uh, well, there were several questions about this, but um, we'd welcome your comments on what the effects of ketogenic diets might be expected to be in CFS patients, um, if that might be problematic, for example, because of low glucose, um, or if they might, it might be predicted to exacerbate any energy metabolism abnormalities that, uh, that have been observed in your studies. Okay, well, um, so, yes, uh, the, so the work that we did and we found, uh, or we, we think what is occurring is that reduction in the ability to make enzymes to break down the food is producing that overgrowth. Um, if you don't have those, then more complicated or proteins and fats may be of an issue. Um, but what well, we work with the clinician and we've obviously, he knows the information that we've given him. Um, he himself prescribes to his 
um, patients to have, uh, he'll give them like, um, like amino acid supplements or proteins, but he'll give digestive enzymes to aid with that sort of stuff. And he does seem to say that there is improvement um, with that. So, but, you know, whether I can <laughs> tell sure. everyone to do that or, yeah, or work that sort of stuff is a different thing. It should also be pointed out that we're, we're not able to prescribe yeah, we're anything not prescribe or, or make any we're formal scientists. clinical recommendations, but really just to sort of comment on the research. There were a, quite a number of food elimination diet sort of things that were tried. I, I don't believe any of them ended up with anything significant. So, yeah, so um, we use ketogenic diet a lot in mitochondrial disease patients, um, and 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 it's a natural metabolism. We we will shift our prefer you know, our metabolic preference from sugar to fat under conditions of stress. Um, fat actually lasts a lot longer. Um, it's what marathon runners are burning at the in the 26th mile. Okay, um, and uh, it's it's actually how many hibernating animals um, you know will uh, um, will will meet the need for energy production um, you know over the winter. So it's a way of providing substrate under conditions where. Um, springtime carbohydrates, you know, the spring harvest, you know, is, is not available. Okay. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I think it has to be applied individually on, you know, with a great deal of, of, you know, kind of consultation with your physician or your, you know, uh, your clinician. Um, you know, this, ketogenic diets are not something to take on individually. They really need to be managed medically. I might just add as well with that, um, the indications that we have is if they're, I mean, the, if your body's using more amino acids or, or fatty acids for energy, uh, the rule of thought, I guess, is to kind of go with that. You know, when, we're not sure whether we should try and stop that and make them do something else or whether actually just aid and assist in that same situation that the body's deciding to do and that's the ketogenic sort of stuff is useful for that. Okay, um, lots of questions uh, surrounding, uh, or a couple questions surrounding recovered patients. Um, can you comment on studies of recovered patients um, that you've spoke, that you've dealt with, or that um, that you've read about to try to understand what might be working for them? Um, perhaps we can focus this, focus this in terms of metabolism and um, the kinds of topics we addressed earlier. Can we ask Ron? I think you're. Aren't you collecting recovery stories, Ron? <laughs> yes, he says. <laughs> I mean, uh, our, our anecdotal experience is everybody has a different recovery story. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of any data that, that I've seen that so I really shouldn't comment. Well, that's just... I think it's as difficult for people to understand why they recovered as, as how they got sick. So, so, so I've heard the same thing. Everyone has a different story. And uh, it's very easy to imagine that something you did caused you to recover, but it actually might have been something completely different than that. And it's my feeling that when people do recover, their body has somehow overcome something. And it's what they happen to have done right before their body finally overcame whatever that was, uh, they might ascribe to... Uh, the reason they recovered, but that may not actually be the reason they recovered. So. Yeah, one, one of the things, of course, is, and I hate to say this, is that uh, in a lot of people who have recovered, they've also relapsed. Uh, and typically, uh, this, and this happens uh, again and again, that the people, once they do feel better, they think they're going to always be better. And almost always, they do something that they know triggered the, the relapse. So just a warning. Just, just one, one thing we do again. see is if we look at families, we look at sufferers and families and controls, what we see metabolically is that they're intermediary. So if, if they've, if they've so-called got better, it may simply mean they've shifted down to what the rest of their family is. I mean, we haven't had a good look at the genetics behind that, but I'm, I'm sure... Um, homozygote expression in 
in the sufferers and heterozygote expression in, in the rest of the family may be may have something to do with that, as well as vo and pathogen exposure, etc. So there'll be clinicians in the audience here that have uh, much more you know, collective experience than we do with recovery. Um, but you know, the, uh, the Alan, I want to echo Alan's comments is, is that um, you know, it, it, even after recovery, um, the, the same unique characteristics that um, you know, potentially made you vulnerable to getting ME-CFS in the first place you know, can remain. And so, you know, Dumb, uh, so, so um, the solution of con you know constant vigilance, vigilance is you know um, still important to be able to maintain health. Yeah, I was going to echo very similar sentiments, um, and I think some of the the problems with recognizing this as a physiological disorder is that people feel like when they've got over it, they're past it. And if you know that it's a physiological condition that you've had and that you've got, you know, you've improved your position within that then you have a better understanding of where you are once you're post-recovery and know that that may be ongoing, so. And I also want to stress that the importance of having longitudinal studies and uh, repetitive sampling, because uh, to follow up on each individual would be a f fantastic way of finding out what's going on. Absolutely, yeah. That's been a very common theme in our, in our uh, discussion in the last couple of days as well. So it's good to see that coming back. Um, another common theme is, uh, is mitochondria um, as the sort of centers of metabolism. Uh, so as you can imagine, there were a lot of questions about that. Um, I'm gonna call on Bob to maybe address um, one, of, uh, one that you could maybe help explain to everybody who doesn't really necessarily understand uh, mitochondrial biology and disease and the differences between mitochondrial disease in a classical sense and the mitochondrial dysfunction that we see in CFS patients. So in the field of mitochondrial medicine, we make a division between primary mitochondrial disease that have um, specific mutations in, in you know, the enzymes that we use to make ATP using oxygen, so the oxidative phosphorylation genes. Those um, are typically lethal disorders that cascade um, uh, and, and, and degenerate over a, a period of years um, and uh, are not easy to modify. The interesting thing that we discovered, you know, so, so we developed a mitochondrial cocktail to take care of those kids to support overall mitochondrial function in the 90s. Um, and we would get about 15% clinical benefit. Um, to my great shock and delight, the same cocktails ended up having an even better effect in autism than they have in, you know, in, in the primary mitochondrial disease patients. Um, and, and many patients with ME-CFS also benefit from, you know, um, uh, you know the mitochondrial, you know, broad-based mitochondrial um, cofactor support. Um, so the thing, I guess the message that I have is that there, the class, so that there are the primary forms of mitochondrial disease are ones that are um, uh, where there's a, there's a fixed lesion that is not something that uh, we can get past, okay? But the secondary forms of mitochondrial dysfunction, where mitochondria are, have a kind of regulated dysfunction, where their dynamic communication with the nucleus is changed so that the nucleus is telling the mitochondria, okay, your job is no longer to make the maximum amount of energy, your job is actually to help defend the cell or to take on another function. When that happens, okay, then we have, you know, we have a kind of mitochondrial dysfunction that actually can be treated, okay? It's not fixed, and the hopeful message is, is that you can gradually, you know, with, with the right treatments that you know, we don't necessarily have yet, but I've, I'm convinced we will have, that um, we will, gradually be able to, to restore more normal function and re, redirect mitochondria away from those, the, the, the operating instructions they were using on, you know, when a person was sick to the new operating instructions um, you know, when they're well again. One thing we need to be aware of is that mitochondria are not a unique, totally individual component. The vast majority of the little proteins within them are from our autosomal DNA, so they, 
They, they, if you look at complex one, there's five components made by the mitochondria and 40 that come into the cell, into the mitochondria from the, from the, out, from the exterior environment. And virtually every, I mean, the, the ribosomes, for instance, I think a small component of them is also mitochondrial, and the vast majority of it is from our autosomal DNA. So if, if we've got um, people that have, uh, have mitochondrial group H5 or whatever, and they've evolved in a small ethnic community, and we compare, and then we intermarry those with, with some other group from a totally different, um, we're like, we, that we, pot, we have the potential to have a series of mutations within the autosomal DNA that it may not be entirely consistent with the proper function of mitochondria. So it's a very complex thing. Don't think of them as just a little thing that's self-contained. Yeah, I think th thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's, a, it's a common misconception that all of the proteins that are used to make a mitochondria are encoded in the mitochondrial genome, and actually only 13 of them are. There's a thousand that come from the nucleus and are imported into mitochondria. So if you're trying to understand mitochondrial function, you really need, um, the, the nuclear genome is arguably even more important um, if you're looking for mutations that are variants that might be explaining phenotypes. Um, Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, so um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on Bob again. I'm sorry to be biased here, but so many questions came in about Suriman. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to answer them in just a, just a minute before we do our final question. Um, the questions were really surrounding the, um, the use of Suriman and testing in, in uh, MECFS patients, um, what, uh, what the sort of uh, status of that is and if it will be available for patients. Um, within and outside of the United States? Two problems with Suriman. One is a 100-year-old drug, so it's long out of patent. Um, and Bayer is the manufacturer, um, but they've been making it um, free of charge and giving it to the World Health Organization each year um, for, for, for them to distribute in Africa for, the sleep, for treatment of African sleeping sickness. The second problem is, um, well, so, so there's um, a difficulty for any commercial sponsor to... Um, uh, see a profit incentive for developing Suriman. Okay, so the second, the second, that has to do with the patent issues. The second issue is that um, it's, uh, it's so inexpensive to make that in, you know, kind of African dollars, um, the amount of Suriman we need to treat one child, an eight-year-old child um, for a whole year would be $27. Okay, so again, you know, th th these are, frustratingly you know, practical issues that have to do with um, getting the commercial, because the clinical trials, bringing it to, to a phase three clinical trial over the next five years, um, is gonna cost about $20 million, okay? So um, you, you can see that you know, there are some practical um, you know, difficulties. And so we do have a new commercial um, sponsor that's interested in this, that's um, you know, looking into it, actually manufacturing their own sermon. Um, uh, but it'll take a, a year and a half for them to, to come online. Um, the other interesting thing that, you know, is from people that may track Bayer, um, you know, so they're, they're branded as a, um, as a uh, cardiovascular and infectious disease company. And so they've, they've told me that they, you know, um, you know, support our work on the one hand, but on the other hand, they'll never be a company to um, treat, to offer a drug for autism or, or offer a drug for ME-CFS. And that would have to be, you know, another, other companies. But what has come onto their radar is in the last couple of years, it's been shown that Suriman actually inhibits the entry of Ebola virus into cells and culture. It also inhibits the entry of Zika virus into cells and culture. It inhibits the entry of you know, enteroviruses into you know, in, in cells and culture. Um, and so th that's a more infectious disease related application of Suriman um, that's gotten to the point where they've actually built a new manufacturing plant, um, you know, to, to you know, potentially develop Suriman for other applications. But um, we're still frustratingly uh, stalled or delayed, I guess is a better way of saying it, for you know, um, really moving the, the studies forward in, in both autism and ME-CFS.
All right, well, I'm gonna change it to a more positive note than that one, um, because a lot of patients, uh, or a lot of, yeah, a lot of people who said they were patients uh, mentioned that um, they would be willing to volunteer to sort of um, uh, be subjects in, in our research, and they asked about um, a sort of central mechanism for patients to register as a, as a donor for researchers. Um, I think that's fantastic. I don't know of one. If any of you want to comment on anything like that you have available in your individual labs. Um, but I think that might be a big action item, and we certainly have been discussing in the last couple of days um, the need for uh, better mechanisms for sharing all of, all of the, not only samples and, and, and patients, but um, data and protocols and, and uh, methods. So that's certainly something that we're thinking about, but I, I wanted to point that out. And, and, uh, One of the biggest problems we have is ethics committees. So yes. we've, we've got a whole series of, whole series of things we need to be acutely aware of. Yeah. If you're going to design something like that, it must comply. Um, and it, there's probably going to be ethics committees in different countries that want different things. So it's going to make it even more difficult. But I'm sure it's not an, ins an insurmountable problem. So. No, and we have, so we have on our, we'll be opening up this website for Melbourne Bioanalytics. And I think there is a, at least a, 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 a form that a, a form that people can send out and send to us if they want to, uh, you know, register their interests. This is for obviously studies in Melbourne. It's difficult to get people from everywhere around the world. But if anyone's listening um, from Melbourne as well, um, yeah, they can register their interests there or in Australia. And um, right. yeah, and even even if they're from other areas, it's we can also register because we're collaborating or working with everyone, and we will obviously pass on any names or information that we get from people. Right. Thank you so much, Chris. I, I think, um, yeah, that addresses um, other questions from patients who have been interested in doing metabol met metabolomics and metabolic testing of their own. So I think probably right now the best, the best answer to that is in, in conjunction with researchers, and we're all very eager to do that, ethics issues pending. Um, all right, so uh, I think we're all getting hungry. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up now. I'd like to thank our panelists and speakers for the morning.